On September 4, 1944, the Minutemen of Company 769 were holding their final meeting. The Minutemen were a group of citizens who were organized during World War II to protect the country from acts of sabotage. Part of the training they received was how to extinguish fires. The 17 men at the final meeting decided to reorganize themselves as a fire department, and that was the beginning of the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department. 75 years is a long time. 75 years of extreme dedication from our membership. The volunteer department here has come a long ways over the years from when I joined. We still do the same thing we did in 1944, and that is we put the wet stuff on the red stuff, and that's about the only things that stayed the same. Well, I think we've been doing something right if we got only 75 years, and I hope to be here for 75 more years after this. As historian for the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department, I've researched a lot of our company's history. The company started when a group of 18 men got together in 1944 to start a new fire department. We call these men our charter members. These 18 men were ordinary citizens from all walks of life. They included several farmers, farm supply workers, a stockyard worker, a country store owner who was also the postmaster at West Friendship, a coffee producer, a machinist, and the deputy sheriff. But basically, they were just a, an average group of guys. At the first meeting they held in 1944, they took up a collection among themselves, and they collected a grand total of $17.40. And this was the start of our treasury. They agreed to canvas the neighborhood to try to recruit new members. They later purchased a uh, 1928 Buick sedan for $100 with uh, the option of one year to pay for it. They stripped the body off of the sedan and converted it into a fire truck. They added a pump, a water tank, a ladder, and some hose. And uh, that, was the, that was the first fire apparatus. I believe they called it Nellie Bell. My father, Noble Saunders, was one of the original founders of the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department. He was one of the 18 charter members. My father was very mechanically inclined. He had, uh, had, didn't have much education, but he was a, a very mechanical brain. He was a machinist by trade, so he helped build and repair the first fire engine. And he used to talk about how, you know, they'd have to do a lot of repairs to it sometimes and how they'd have to makeshift things to fix it because it wasn't any companies around that actually did these repairs. Between March of 1945 and December of 1945, they responded to a total of 16 calls. And these 16 fire calls included numerous brush fires and woods fires, uh, one house fire, several barn fires, an auto collision, and uh, a chicken coop that was on fire. Actually, they saved a couple barns and I believe they saved the house. Not sure about the chicken coop. And my first call I ever went on was a barn fire. And the guys, of course, then we rode the back step of the fire truck, which you don't do anymore. But the guys, it was five of us on there. And four guys was around, sort of around behind me, told me to get up front, they were afraid I was gonna fall off or something. <laughs> By the end of 1945, they had close to $2,000 in their treasury, and they decided to purchase a international K2 chassis, which they custom built a fire truck on, on the chassis. So now they had uh, two fire engines. The firemen's wives started to become involved in the fundraising activities. The ladies decided to organize a ladies' auxiliary, and on January 21, 1946, a group of 13 ladies met at the West Friendship School for that purpose. The purpose in those days was to, as it is today, to support the membership, the operational people of the company. The auxiliary in those days a lot of times would provide meals to firefighters when they came back from a long call because in those days we didn't have the nice equipment we have today. They were out longer. Subsequently, it, it took a toll on people. Plus, the auxiliary did fundraising because in days gone by, uh, money was hard to come by and the cost was there, so they did the fundraising. In the first six months, the ladies had $113.92 in the treasury. They were very proud to donate $100 of this to the men. During the late 1940s, the department responded to between 20 and 30 fire calls a year, including house fires, woods and field fires, and miscellaneous calls. 
They were also kept busy with a lot of barn fires that were started by spontaneous combustion from storing green, wet hay. The houses were what they're called, they call legacy homes back then, and actually now they're calling them legacy homes. They were built out of dimensional lumber, so if the house was on fire when the call's made, it's still on fire when you get there and you had an opportunity to try to put the fire out, you may have to chase it through the walls. But it was a lot of natural materials, it was a lot of cottons and wood, where now 90% of everything in a home is a hydrocarbon based something, whether it's the furniture, the wall covering, the siding. So it burns really quick and it doesn't give you a lot of time to go in and put the fire out. The department occupied its new quarters in April of 1950 and by the late 50s, expansion of the building, including an extra bay, was in the planning stages. In 1950, our service area contained about 2,500 people and covered 35 square miles. The area has changed enormous. When I first joined, there were no traffic lights in West Friendship. Now we got a handful. There was no townhouses, no apartments, none of that stuff. During the 1950s, the department responded to an average of 40 fire calls per year, with the year 1959 having 84 fires. When I joined in 57, we was lucky to have 30 calls a year. Of course, then we didn't have no ambulance, it was just fire calls. And then, of course, once we got an ambulance years later, then the calls picked up. And now we probably have up in the thousands or so calls a year. There was no central alarm, so to report a fire, you had to call Sykesville 521 J1, which rang into the chief's house. The chief's wife, Mrs. Molesworth, then activated a hand crank which blew the fire siren. Then Mrs. Molesworth came to the station to handle the phone and the radio when the firemen went out to fight the blaze. In 1954, the department purchased a new international Class A pumper at a cost of $15,000. This was our first factory-built fire truck. In 1957, the first annual roast beef supper was held by the Ladies Auxiliary to raise funds. We used to have these suppers and uh, the day before the suppers would, uh, we would hold the suppers, um, the guys would pull out all the equipment and they clean the whole floors and then some of the, um, the older members would come up and would they do peel potatoes? potatoes and yeah, we would peel potatoes, we would have to go and we'd make the coleslaw and everything. So everything was basically homemade, I mean, yeah. that we had because we had a lady um, Helen Grimes, she would do rolls, she baked homemade rolls and stuff. During the 1960s, the department faced some of its biggest challenges. There were two major airplane crashes, a large brush fire and woods fire that burned out of control, and the start of a much needed ambulance service. In 1961, a new addition was built to add additional garage space, bunk rooms, a meeting room, and a recreational area. We added on to the old building from the time they built it to the time we left there, we added on to it four times. And the third, the fourth time was pretty significant, but any time you rebuild a building and add on to it, you have problems. And we had quite a few problems, leaks and that type of thing. In November of 1962, a United Airlines turboprop airliner crashed on the Gaither Farm near Homeward Road and Route 108, killing all 17 persons aboard. Fire and rescue units responded from West Friendship, Clarksville, Ellicott Seed, and Elkridge were met with a large debris field burning fiercely from airplane fuel and magnesium. Foam units had to be called in from Friendship Airport to help extinguish the blaze. I'm not sure which plane crash it was, but when I was in West Friendship Elementary, being on the second floor, seeing fire equipment going by, and the teacher would scold us and tell us to sit down and we'd get back up and look. And it literally looked like fire equipment was going by for an hour. And it was all different colors of stuff I'd never seen before. It was purple and black and red and blue. So that was very interesting at a young age. I just wanted to know what they were doing, where they were going. Wasn't a lot of members, but we had a fair amount. Mostly families, like your parents would be a member and then the children would join. And sometimes we had some pretty good sized families in the department. Back when I joined, we had a lot of people that were local. Okay, a lot of family members that, you know, came in as clusters, you know, and, they, and they, their kids and grandkids all came into the department. Practically everybody in my family is in some kind of public safety, mostly in the fire service. Um, and I say it's, it's coming up through them. It was really a pleasure and a, a privilege to be able to ride calls that it's sometimes the only people on the calls were all family members on the piece of equipment that left. 
So that was, that was very unique. I have some pictures of when I was probably six or seven years old next to some of the equipment that um, I was at a later date operating off of those pieces of equipment as a firefighter um, that were still around. They were old, but you know, were still operating you know, off of that piece as a senior firefighter. You know, to me, that was, a, that was a piece of history in myself and, and seeing that success. Um, so it made me feel good you know, uh, later to put those pieces of the puzzle together. In November of 1967, a U.S. Army C-47 cargo plane was forced to make an emergency landing on the Mercer Farm between Frederick Road and I-70 with its right engine on fire. West Friendship firemen were first on the scene and contained the blaze until help arrived from Lisbon, Clarksville, Ellicott City, and Elkridge to extinguish the fire. When we first came here, we had very little equipment. Uh, we didn't even have an ambulance at the time. Uh, the ambulance went in service in 69. Uh, we used to always depend on you know, Clarksville, Elka City, and we realized that EMS is the future of the fire service because probably 75% of our operation is EMS. Well, when I came in, we had just duck turnout coats, just a plain old waterproof coat, three-quarter boots, metal helmets that if you took off after a fire, you burnt your fingers. Uh, they deteriorated. Uh, our gloves were rubber gloves, so we didn't get uh, hands wet. And now we have turnout pants, four encapsulated, SCVA. When I went first came in, we only had two SCBA. And now we wouldn't even consider even going inside a building with SCBA. And that's a self-contained breathing apparatus. In 1969, the Glenwood Lions Club helped the department purchase their first ambulance, a 1965 Cadillac. Thirty-six people, including six ladies from the auxiliary, took advanced first aid training to stay at the unit. During the first year, they answered 210 calls. When I joined the ladies auxiliary, we had dues, and the dues were 60 cents. <laughs> so kind of when I, around when I became president, I, we kind of like, decide, well, why don't we just make it a dollar? It'd be you know, easier just to make it a dollar because I'm sure the 60 cents started in 1946 when the old story started. So we did make it a dollar, but now we don't, we somehow along the line, we just, we don't give dues anymore. By the start of the 70s, the department had two engines, two four-wheel drive brush units, and a new ambulance. I aspire to be a driver. I love driving. To this day, I love driving. The first engine that I learned how to drive on, the steering wheel was so big, when you made a turn, you had to stand up. It had no power steering. It was a stick shift. It, it was just a cantankerous thing to drive. I always remember my half-brother, Dave, uh, he was a stickler for, for doing everything right when you drove. And I remember the first time I drove an engine for driver's training, he told me he didn't care where I parked it, but I only got one chance to back it in the building. Harrod County was struck by Hurricane Agnes in 1972, and flooding caused extremely heavy property damage and a loss of life. Crews from Engine 33 and Ambulance 35 assisted with rescues of people in the Marysville and Henryton areas. Growing up in the community, the disadvantage is you run a lot of medical calls or trauma calls that either the people or relatives that you've known your whole life, or there's people that you've, you've gone through high school with, and that, that's the disadvantage. Um, I've seen a lot of people in the community that, that have passed away that I knew that I grew up with. And, and I guess it was a privilege to be able to take care of them. In 1978, the Junior Fire Department was started with seven members from 13 to 15 years old. They helped out with fundraising activities, cleaning the firehouse and equipment. The purpose of the Junior Fire Department was to attract new members at a young age and kind of lead them down the path to membership in the Senior Fire Department. To that effect, it was very successful. Over the years, we've had a great number of current members who were junior firemen who started out as juniors. In 1979, a 2,000 gallon Ford tanker was purchased and a new addition was built to house this newest piece of equipment. To help answer calls during the daytime, the first pay fired fighters were hired in 1979. When I was chief, I was getting to where we was gonna have to have some paid people and I said, let's, uh, let's look into getting some paramedics. The county had paramedics already in some of the stations in the county. We was uh, finally able to get that started and get the money from the county so we'd have money to pay them. And the program just kept growing and growing. As an EMS uh, provider, as a paramedic, we were oftentimes in, in a position where 
our skills had to keep the patient alive for a longer period of time because we were further away from the hospital. So there were those challenges and opportunities to impact uh, life. Uh, there have been many incidents on I-70 and, and elsewhere and some house fires that uh, really gave us an opportunity to, to work together and develop you know, operational tactics that uh, both career and volunteer could uh, benefit from. In 1982, the department purchased its first Type 3 ambulance with a walk-through cab. The unit was equipped with a new mechanical thumper to perform CPR on cardiac arrests. But our high school caught on fire uh, in 1983, and um, uh, I was on the first piece of apparatus, first engine at the scene, and um, you know closed our school down for, you know, good thing. Closed our school down right, you know, beginning of the year for, uh, you know, the fire. Um, but it was, you know, it was, a, uh, it was a different event to have to go fight a fire at your school. When you're in high school, you always think, man, somebody burned this place down because I don't have to go here. But in reality, we had a call one morning and, and we didn't think anything of it until we pulled up and we saw the school was actually on fire. And uh, it's a, a little sobering, the school you attended for four years, now you're, you know, you're breaking into it trying to put the fire out. Our longest response was to West Virginia. They had a major fire and our tank truck went all the way to West Virginia on a call. They needed mutual aid from different jurisdictions and uh, tank trucks. And when you find uh, rural areas, if you don't bring the water with you, you don't have the water to fight the fire. You know, when I joined back in the 80s, one of the things that was really nice is we had softball games every Sunday just about behind the station. I can remember one of the softball games I think we were playing like, I think it was like WPOC or something for just an event. And, you know, it was just a little kind of funny thing. I got up to bat and smacked the ball out there and took off running, running around first base, and they're waving me on, running second base. Tripped and fell going to second base and got up and my wrist was just, I was like, uh-oh, I think I broke my wrist, broke my wrist. Well, come to find out, there was no hole, there was no nothing. Um, my shoestrings were untied, and I stepped on my shoestring. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> but, um, you know, we had a lot of fun stuff like that. We had a lot of family-oriented activities. Uh, we played softball games. We, every Friday night, we'd get together for a volleyball game. Young families would bring their children. Uh, we had a playground set. The kids would play on the swings while we played volleyball. Uh, and, you know, we just hang around the station and, you know, wait for the whistle to blow <laughs> and go to our next call. When I joined originally, it was the old firehouse down on Frederick Road. Um, the firehouse was much smaller. You were much closer to everyone. And one of the nice things about it was it kept everybody very close together. You were either in the kitchen or you were in the upstairs uh, rec room area. but. There wasn't a lot of places to go, so it kept everybody really close. It was much more family-oriented. Um, I think it still is today, but the old station was much smaller, so everyone ate dinner together, everyone watched TV together. When you cleaned apparatus, everyone was there. Back in the day, there wasn't a lot of computers or there weren't um, cell phones, certainly. And I can remember that when we got a VCR at the station, because a lot of us didn't have them in our homes at that time, when we got a VCR, it was a big deal. And it was a Saturday night, we'd all go out and rent a movie together and come to the firehouse and um, pop some popcorn. And it was just like a movie theater at the station. And it, it was a lot of great times were had then, and a lot of friendships were developed through that. In July of 1983, the new ambulance became Medic 35, as it was now an advanced life support unit staffed by five part-time paid cardiac rescue technicians who could now provide 24-hour ALS coverage. So in the early days, uh, it wasn't uncommon that I was the only one on duty, uh, especially at nighttime. Um, and obviously, if you get a call, which we didn't have as many calls in those days, uh, all the volunteers would come from home. So I would have to get out of bed, come downstairs, open the doors, uh, pull the engine out or the ambulance out, whatever had to go, and then it was a matter of looking in both directions and see who was on the way up uh, by recognizing their headlights. I used to come from home. We never even slept in the firehouse. Everybody came from home, and most of our members were, were lived within two or three minutes. We had three minutes to get a piece of equipment on the street. 
majority of the time, daytime and nighttime, because there were farmers and everybody else, siren would blow, you hear it blow. Uh, you can come up to the fire station, you got three minutes to get it out. And most, majority of the time it got out with three to four people on it, sometimes more, sometimes less. Back in then, you could, if I heard the siren blow, and I'd leave high school and run a call. Probably not looked upon well today, but back then it was. It was, uh, you, you could do that and get away with it. Back then, your fire trucks were much different. From the back step, you went up to ride in right behind the cab. It was an open cab. So uh, you basically jumped in, you know, it was raining, freezing cold or, you know, summer blazing hot, you were, you know, in an open cab to the incident, fire or whatever. So sometimes you got there and, you know, if it was a fire, you were drenched. You were like, good thing, <laughs> get a little drier. Sometimes today you run a call, it could be just an oven that's on a self-cleaning mode. Back then though, we, we run a fire, it was an actual fire. Uh, we were busy and the fact that we were a limited number of people here, you learned to get a lot of experience at a young age pretty quick. We never slept in the station. We didn't start sleeping in the station probably until the mid 80s. We always depended on people coming from home. But because of time change, the public uh, wants us there a little quicker, or a little bit better response. We allowed people to start sleeping in now it's different. We're here, we have enough people to man the equipment, you're assigned one position, we have a guaranteed crew. It's a different world, but back then it was mostly all volunteer. Anybody that's out on a call for a long period of time, whether it be hot or cold, finds the unit, the canteen one as we now call it, to be a valuable assistance. It's a support piece of equipment. The short analysis is we give people hot stuff on cold days and cold stuff on hot days. And it's staffed by both administrative members, operational members, and auxiliary members of the company. Because when you go out the door, you, there's no telling how long you will be out. In November of 1984, the department responded to a six alarm blaze on Main Street in Ellicott City. More than 100 firefighters from Howard and Baltimore counties fought the blaze, which destroyed six buildings. Engine 3 1 and Tanker 3 were on the scene until the next day. So, a lot of the calls we had back in the 80s and early 90s were brush fires because it was a lot of open space, a lot of cornfields. Of course, you tend to remember the, the worst calls. You know, they're a little hard to get rid of. You sort of carry them with you the rest of your career. I saw a lot of, a lot of things that probably you shouldn't be seeing at 16 to 17 years old. That, Right or wrong, it was we were there to do a job, and we, we learned really pretty quickly how to do it with, with the equipment, what we had. I've responded to a lot of calls over the years that deal with life and death situations, and uh, it plays with your emotions. It can be a roller coaster of emotions at times. We had a member here that I was on that hit a tree, and I was on the scene, and uh, he begged me the whole time he was in the truck to not let him die, not let me die. And as soon as we got him out of the truck, put him on a cot, he went to full arrest and died. So that kind of hit me pretty hard. One day that I'll always remember was the best day and the worst day, all in one, in one day. Paramedic Randy Stair and myself answered a call from maternity. Um, shortly after our arrival, uh, we assisted the mother in giving birth to a beautiful baby girl. I called dispatch and informed them that uh, we now had two patients and uh, they wanted to know what it was. I told them it was a baby girl. And uh, I could almost hear the, the dispatchers giving each other high fives. Everybody was happy. Um, so we returned to the station. A few hours later, we were dispatched uh, on another call for um, chest pains and trouble breathing. When we got there, uh, we encountered uh, an elderly gentleman in extreme distress, and he went into cardiac arrest minutes after we arrived on the scene. Despite our best efforts, we were unable to revive the gentleman, and he expired. You can say that on this one particular day, uh, I got to witness a new life coming into this world, and on the, on the other spectrum, I saw an, another life coming to an end. When I started, we didn't have stress debriefings, and we saw some pretty nasty things, and people would think, well, did I do enough, did I do enough? And I tried to explain to them as a chief officer that you did your best. You gotta realize that 
Sometimes you know, I can't do everything to save everybody. And I learned a long time ago, don't get emotionally involved because if you do, you, uh, it, you start forgetting what your job is if you get too emotionally involved. And now since we have stress debriefings, I think it helps a lot of the younger members deal with the aftermath of an unusual situation, whether it's a child fatality, a house fatality, or whatever it may be, uh, it really helps. Well, when you, when you go through things like that, you, you, you develop a bond with your fellow firefighters and EMTs. I mean, some of the situations that you have to deal with, um, you rely on each other. But there were a lot of good calls as well where, you know, you go out on a cardiac arrest and someone ends up getting a save out of it and they're good, I don't want to say good as new, but, um, you know, you can meet them when they've recovered, they're in good condition and they have, you know, quite a few more years of, of life. Uh, a lady I went to high school with, um, really bad wreck. She'd fall asleep at the wheel. She actually was was there all night. Um, somebody found her going to work the next morning, and um, they took her to shock trauma. She was pretty much from the from the hips down was everything broken. Pelvis broke, legs broke, femurs. Um, and I thought that when we left the scene that she would probably never walk again. So here she shows up probably six weeks later at the fire station in a wheelchair. But the fact that she was motivating and she told me she was, you know, going to learn, she was on her way to, to walking again. And she came, within a year, she was walking with a cane. So that was kind of a good story. It was uh, one of my duty crew nights. We were here, and we usually do training and stuff like that. It was kind of a little eerie um, on, on that part. Um, I was trying to figure out some kind of training. I was thinking to myself, okay, so I'm going to have our crew just chatting, you know, in the kitchen, and I'm gonna have somebody come in and say, hey, uh, somebody just came in, uh, they had a heart attack. They pulled up in a car in a parking lot, and I didn't tell my crew or nothing, and we were gonna train just like that. They had no idea, I wanted to see, you know, hey, go out there, and I had a, I actually had a dummy out there and stuff. And the kind of crazy part, eerie part, was after I had it all set, five minutes or so, I was almost ready to kind of get it started. And one of our members come running in and said, one of our members is laying out in the parking lot. I think he had a heart attack. And everything kind of came to true. One of our members out in the parking lot uh, had a heart attack went out there and it all turned, the training turned into a reel. Everybody did what the, exactly what they're supposed to be and, you know, he is here today. Sometimes you actually get to save a life uh, and knowing that you're out there making a difference, that's what keeps us going. That's why we do what we do. Something inside's really great when I help somebody and that's, I mean, that's really, that's, you're like, okay, that's why I'm here and you get the thank yous out of it, and that means a lot. Just a simple thank you means a whole lot. In 1987, the department assisted with a major Amtrak train disaster in Chase, Maryland, that claimed 12 lives and injured 175 people. In January 1990, construction began on another new addition to include an engine bay for the new American Eagle tanker, engine 3-4. Offices and a new bunk room were added on the second floor. Dedication ceremonies were held in October and the building was later rededicated to Chief and Mrs. Earl Molesworth. I was just coming in when Mr. Earl Molesworth kind of faded out and he was an elderly gentleman, very uh, set in his ways, but a nice guy. If he liked you, he liked you. If he didn't, well, and he just, he needed to stay away from it. He was a member and then he was a former chief. He was chief for a long time. Um, and he was a very iron-fisted chief. Uh, he didn't allow any leeway on any, any shenanigans or anything like that. If he stopped in and there was a horseplay going on, it quick ended pretty quick. Right after we started sleeping in, uh, Earl Mersworth, who was chief for 20-some years, passed away, and uh, the guys upstairs would, wouldn't sleep. Nobody would sleep in by themselves because they'd be in the bunk room, they'd hear some noise out, they'd walk out into the TV room, and the chair would sit there rocking back and forth, or the chair would fall over, and there's nobody else there. 
But there was always the, the, the talk of, of um, things happening. And, and I was up, in the, it came in the building in the Watts office, I was sitting downstairs and I heard a noise upstairs. And I knew I was the only one there. So I went upstairs and went in the, the, the TV room where they had a television and a pool table and there was two chairs rocking, rocking chairs. We had these recliner rockers and two of them were rocking. I stopped it, went back downstairs. Another occasion I heard noise like a pool ball rolling across the table. When I went upstairs again, I saw a pool ball just coming to a stop and fall in the pocket. Nobody would ever sleep in the firehouse by themselves. It was haunted. Yeah, they, they, they say it was haunted, I mean, you know, but. There was a sign hanging in the engine bay that said nobody under 21 allowed in the equipment. That sign was taken down at one point and a lot of weird stuff happened. It would be nothing to ride by at night and the lights would be on. You'd go in, you turn the light, think somebody left, and it was like your home. You know, you don't need the lights on. Why do you need the lights on if nobody was there? So you go in, you turn the lights off, you go back down the road. A couple minutes later, somebody would call you on the phone and say, hey, were you just at the firehouse? The lights are on. I'm like, no, I turned them off. Well, they're back on now. So some things like that, you really can't explain. Um, the sign went up pretty quick, and if you'll notice, it's hanging in this building as well. So when we moved to this station, we said, if nothing else goes to that station, that sign goes, and it's now sitting in the uh, engine room between the ladder truck and the uh, engine. I don't know whether it's an actual ghost, but it's a lot of, a lot of unusual things happen. In 1992, the ladies' auxiliary dropped the word ladies from their name and began accepting men as members. In 1992, they voted to donate their 10 burner gas stove to B. Gaddy, who ran a Baltimore food kitchen and homeless shelter. We also uh, put out a cookbook as a fundraiser. Here's the cookbook. And it was made up of the ladies' auxiliary uh, solicited recipes from different people, from the firemen's wives and different ones. And then it was just a, a handmade. We, we did that everything ourselves. We didn't go to a publisher. We typed all the recipes. We had it run off ourselves and put it together. And then we sold it as a fundraiser. We, we've had plenty of fundraisers over the years. I remember when I first joined, we used to have a crab feast at the old firehouse. We've gotten away from that and we have our annual banquet now. That is a lot of fun and you get to get outside of the firehouse and enjoy time with the people who you actively participate in the firehouse with. You know, we have a couple fundraisers, uh, portrait fundraiser we've been doing for years, but the fair is, it, that's our very biggest. The fair was always a historical moment within every year that, you know, the, the fire service has been alive. Basically for the whole week of fair, basically firehouses transferred down to the fair. The bingo tent was like the size of a circus tent and it seemed like it took three days to put the thing up. When we first did the bingo at the fair, we used to put up a big tent, tent. Yes. and it was all outside and the, we had the cards and the card markers were corn, kernels of corn. Mm -hmm. But now we've sophisticated, we're in an air conditioned <laughs> building and we have our little cards that just move the little, the little windows over to, to, to do the yeah. bingo. So. It's come a long way. Yeah. We used to have lots and lots of stands up there. We only have a few stands now, but yeah. they're, uh, they're good money makers and we all enjoy, everybody gets together and you know, yeah. we all pitch in. Fair week is fun. You know, you, it's, you get to go hang out at the fair for free. You can't ride any rides, you can't mess around like that, but you get to see the people, you get the people watch, you get to interact with uh, the community. Um, you get to hang out with members of the department, kind of off duty a little bit, you know, it's a little bit more relaxed. You still have a job to do, you're still gonna be in uniform, and then if a call goes out, you're, you're there. But you're at the fair, you know, you get fair food, stuff like that. You spend seven days, eight days with the same group of people if you work the same stand. So you spend more time with them that week than you probably do your own family. Back then, we would tear down on Sunday morning. So on Saturday night, everybody would get together uh, after the fair and we would hang out by the booze and you know, bring the radios up and sit around and just relax and kind of unwind from the week. Now everybody talks about the county fair because of course that's, that's a whole week long affair and um, it's not only a fundraiser, but it's our chance to interact with the community. There was, there was two or three people that I'd gone to high school with that lived, one, one woman lives in Alaska and the only time she'd come home would be the week of the fair from Alaska just to, to go to the fair. You know, my dad was very involved in politics when I was a kid there, and so we were always there working with the politicians, and, and I just remember seeing the trucks and, and being impressed by that, and, and just, just the presence of West French and Volunteer Fire Department at the fair. It seemed almost like it was their fair. In August of 1992, Hurricane Andrew traveled up the East Coast, spawning many tornadoes, one of which touched down in West Friendship. 
The tornado's path went from Folly Quarter Road to the Howard County Fairgrounds, causing over a million dollars in damage along the way. The department responded in full force, assisting homeowners in rescuing an 88-year-old woman trapped when a tree fell on her house. West Friendship later received a unit citation from DFRS for its actions. In 1993, before Facebook or social media, the department began publishing a monthly newsletter called The Flashover that was mailed to all members. This continued until 2006 when The Flashover was incorporated into the department's new website. As we close out the 20th century and enter the new millennium, there are major improvements on the horizon, including, for the first time, a new ladder truck, which gives the department new capabilities as a truck company. There are also improvements to our rural water supply. And as full-time career firefighters began staffing the old West Friendship Station, plans were being made for a new station. Sadly, tragedy struck the department during this time as we mourn the loss of two of our members killed in the line of duty while the Howard County DFRS suffered their first line of duty death. At times while performing our, uh, our duties in fire and EMS, sometimes our members make an, the ultimate sacrifice. Luke, I can remember when he was in the academy, he actually spent a lot of time at the firehouse and he'd be upstairs in the boardroom just all his books spread out and studying everything because when Luke did something, he did something to the best. And I mean, he studied real hard. And uh, one tragic night, they called me and told me that one of their members was working in Montgomery County and was en route to shock trauma. And uh, he, was, he succumbed to his injuries though and, and passed away. In two days time after that, uh, there was a funeral for Luke. And, you know, to be involved in something like that, uh, his parents were very emphatic that they wanted the uh, fire department, West Friendship, to be involved because he was a part of us and, and the fire department is so much a part of him. I often think about Luke. Um, I have a look when my Class A uniform, I have uh, a lapel with his name on it that, that I always wear. So we had lost Luke in 2007 and then we lost Eric. So we got hit really hard. Eric Stasiak's um, death um, really, I guess, hit home. I remember it was January very clearly. Captain Eric Stasiak, who was a uh, captain here, volunteer captain here at our station, he was working in, at Bel Air in Harford County as a medic, and they responded on a call, um, and there was a tragic incident in, at the scene of one of the, the calls. I was assigned, I guess, as the, as the family contact person, and I stayed with uh, the Stasiaks through the whole, the whole ordeal, taking them to Hartford County, notifications. Um, that, that was a lot of work. It's not something that I would I want to do again, but it was a, uh, it, it took a, I think took part of me, you know, to have to, uh, took part of me away in my heart to have to go through that, and I would not want anybody else to go through what we had to go through much less the parents have to go through that. And those that knew Eric, he had a great personality. He would make you laugh. He would do anything for anybody. And it just, it was a huge hit for this department. Um, he was my captain on my crew, on my duty crew night. Um, he was loved by all. And that was, uh, it was very sad to, to lose him. Recently, uh, one of the uh, line of duty deaths that really uh, struck us to our core was the multi-alarm fire that happened in Howard County that took the life of Lieutenant Nathan Flynn. Nathan Flynn, who was a member of the department of Howard County, a career person, was killed in line of duty on July 23rd, early in the morning. The morning that that happened, the folks here, many who didn't know Nathan, uh, were very supportive of the folks here that did know Nathan and of the rest of the department. And that was uh, a very, uh, very trying time for a lot of people. And probably one of the biggest things I've taken out of being a member here is the benefit of that support of everybody coming together. It's a stark reminder that what we do is still an inherently dangerous profession and uh, we need to continue and never forget our members and our loved ones. In 2003, the department purchased 
an American LaFrance Eagle 93-foot tower ladder, designated as Tower 3. This is the first aerial device owned by the department and will enhance truck company capabilities in Western Howard County. The fire service has to stay nimble and, and be uh, prepared to confront new and emerging uh, hazards. Historically, we fought fire within wood frame construction and, and did EMS calls. Now there are additional threats, everything from hazardous material, confined space, uh, weather events, active shooter, to name a few. The only way to stay ahead of the, the curve and, and, and do a good risk analysis is to continue training. We are the only department that has a, a duty crew system that requires our members to be here um, overnight. Uh, and, and that's something I'm very proud of and, and my kudos goes off to him all the time, a man by the name of Dan Poprowski, who started our duty crew system years and years and years ago, um, which I'm so happy that uh, we have able to um, continue that today. There is no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my mind, that's the only thing that keeps our department as active as it is, is, is today. Duty Crew Nights, we've had training from anything from just sitting around and talking, you know, chatting about, hey, what would you do about this or what would you do about that? Um, uh, and other ones, we've completely, you know, went around back or whatever and taken one of our cars and parked, you know, crossways and this and that and have a ride, you know, kind of respond from up here and go around. But one thing that I notice with it, with a very young department, uh, the aggressiveness is there, which is which is awesome to have. You know, people that want to stay up till midnight training, people that want to learn, they want to push forward, they want to get as much knowledge as they can because they're young. In March of 2004, a very large home in Glenelg was completely destroyed by fire as a lack of water hampered the efforts to contain the blaze. This raised concern over rural water supply, and in 2005, the county began installation of dry hydrants, which are non-pressurized outlets that allow water to be drafted from a pond. We get kind of complacent and take for granted where your water comes from for fires and things of that sort. In the eastern part of the county, as I refer to as the city, uh, they have orange water trees that grow up out of the ground and they've got a never-ending supply of water. When you come out to the western end of the county, probably the biggest thing that I learned and benefited from being a member at West Friendship was learning rural water supply and understanding the different tactics that we have to utilize to get the water and also the tactics that you utilize because you have a limited supply of water. In December of 2004, a trial arrangement with DFRS to staff Station 3 with one full-time career paramedic was the beginning of full-time career staffing, which now provides fire and EMS coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are career personnel and volunteer personnel working at the station, but we work together as one company. You know, I hear some places where there's a volunteer station across the street from a career station. Now that's not the best way to use your resources to get that done. And so uh, I'm really proud of the way that we have a strong combination system here. Everybody comes together and we work as one company. So we're all firefighters, EMTs, paramedics. There's not a label on anybody. And we try to keep that running that way because that way everybody's focused on, everybody has one mission. In 2006, ground was broken for a new fire station at Route 32 in Old Frederick Road on ground that was acquired from the Slack family. George Slack was a charter member of the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department. The building is still standing. The county uses it quite a, a bit for some fire service, some other things, as storage. And there, there's the BA shops there. They've re, kind of rebuilt the building. Uh, but we were outgrowing it. We had to build our equipment to match the station door. We had 10-foot doors, and now we have most of our equipment is 11, 12 feet tall, so it wouldn't even fit in there. We had to build our first ladder truck. Had to be under 11 feet to fit in the door. On April 5th, 2009, the flag was lowered for the last time at the old station on Frederick Road and was carried by our members who marched on foot, parade style, to the new fire station at Route 32 in Old Frederick Road. 
The day that we moved to this station, uh, they had a big, I guess it was a parade. They drove the equipment over, several of us marched in, uh, in a big procession for the mile and a half from the old fire station to the new one. And before we left, uh, one of our uh, paid personnel, Irby Purdue, went into the old firehouse and actually was able to sound the siren that used to be used to call people from the fields and the farms to respond at the old station. So it was, uh, it was very nice. You know, people were beeping their horns and driving by and waving as we walked down uh, from 144.32 to 99 to this station. We're more rural out here and we don't have as many places to maybe meet and gather. Uh, when we were having issues with Route 32, especially north of Route 99, we had a couple terrible uh, tragic deaths on Route 32. Uh, we had almost all the community meetings right here at West Friends of Volunteer Fire Department. They got some big meetings. People came in, there's a lot of concern. The issue was right here, right outside the doors. And so uh, that was really important. It seems to me that like, a lot of the things that are happening in the community happen at this fire station. Well, we kind of miss the old firehouse because it was there quite a few years, but uh, this turned out to be much better. Now we have folks from not even from around here. You know, we have people that, that drive from Hagerstown to, uh, to come down here maybe two or three times a week. I don't live in the threes do, and a lot of people that volunteer here do not. They come in for the station, and they pa I pass Clarksville to come and volunteer at West Friendship. Typically, if you go to other stations, they live, you know, right in their first year, right down the road, um, which is ideal. I'd love to, but, you know, I can't take West Friendship home with me. Looking back over the last 75 years, we started out with 18 men and now have over 160 members. We moved from a small wooden garage to a large, modern, state-of-the-art facility. We have gone from rubber coats and metal helmets to modern, fully protective turnout gear. From writing calls on a blackboard to multi-channel radio communications. From riding the back step of fire engines to fully enclosed heated and air-conditioned cabs. From blowing a siren to summons members to volunteer duty crews and career personnel on duty around the clock. Looking back, it begs the question, where do we go from here? No matter what the future may bring, you can be sure we will meet the challenge head on, continuing to provide the best fire and EMS services to the community we serve. As we're celebrating our 75th anniversary with the West French and Volunteer Fire Department, we also have to realize that what got us here won't get us there. We have to be innovative and creative in, in recruiting and keeping the members we have. I know it's a challenge, and I know it's a, we're, we are becoming a dying breed, firefighters and you know, volunteer fire department, but I hope that we can keep pushing through and, and carry on because it is definitely a, an awesome uh, part of history to be a part of. In the fire service, you're a family. It's close-knit because most of the public doesn't understand it. It's just going to be in the military. You're talking about to all the military people. And the fire service, the same thing. We draw on everybody's emotions and friendships to get us through. And it is a big family. You get to see and experience a lot of things that the average person never, never gets to experience. I've gotten uh, the opportunity to see people on their worst day and, uh, and help them in some way. And I've learned that you really can make a difference. With, you don't have to be a paramedic, even as an EMT. Uh, you can really make a difference in someone's life. I'm very proud to have been a part of this organization in Howard County for quite a number of years. I've always enjoyed helping people. And uh, in the fire service, there's plenty of opportunity to do that. My motivation was just be there to help people who's in need of help. I mean, I always enjoy, I enjoy helping people. If somebody needs help, I try to help. I have a strong belief in the volunteer system. I am appreciative of people who are willing to, to take time from their everyday lives to, to sacrifice so that we have people there to help us. Uh, and I think that's important to continue. In celebrating the 75th anniversary of the West Friendship Fire Department, and really any fire department that reaches a milestone like that, Given all the changes in the technology and the time uh, that is needed for the tr advanced training, 
it truly is uh, a feat to be celebrated. It's quite a milestone. Uh, in some cases, volunteer fire companies have not had the support from the community and haven't had the membership, and they have had to disband. Where 75 years, this organization is still prospering and will probably go on for many more years. So it, it's proud to be part of something that's done such a great job. Reaching 75 years in a volunteer fire service is a huge milestone. It just shows the dedication of those in the community, um, the dedication that we have in our membership, the dedication that we have in our families who let us leave home to come to the firehouse to run calls, to attend meetings, trainings. I, I think that 75 years is a huge accomplishment that everyone should be proud of. Please know that we appreciate you. Please know that you know, we all are thankful for the service you provide to us. We're thankful for the sacrifice. We're thankful to the families who allow you to sacrifice for us. You are absolutely my favorite fire station. You do the best job. I love the way you uh, work with youngsters in the community and bring them along and teach them teamwork and teach them how to, to do a job and do it well. We would not be the community we are today without the West Branch Volunteer Fire Department, but whether it's be the fairgrounds, whether it's supporting our sports teams, whether it's helping us with Santa Claus, whether it's protecting us, of course, in any kind of a tragedy, uh, but they're there for us when we need them, and I just want them to know that, that we appreciate that. I'm very proud of my fire department. I am very uh, excited to celebrate your anniversary, and I certainly wish you many, many more decades of good service to our community. We are so blessed to have you. Well, I feel proud to be part of this department. I think the, the public ought to be glad to have a department the size of this department to run calls in their area. Looking back at the, at the members that built this, you know, it didn't start with me, it didn't start with a lot of people that were here, um, but looking back on the foundation of the department and, um, and recognizing that, because we are the middle building, building blocks of this organization. I think that would bring a lot to this company, being here for 75 years, and hopefully that we're here for another 100 or 175 more. And the membership keeps on going, and keeps on getting stronger. I am very honored and very pleased to be a member of Station 3. I've learned so much. Uh, they've given me so many opportunities, both to serve the community and to develop myself and to grow personally. And it's a wonderful thing. I wish more people would volunteer. I don't think a lot of folks realize the tremendous opportunities that you have when you volunteer with the fire service. We'd like to welcome you to the 75th anniversary banquet of the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department. It is amazing to think that an organization that started with 17 people, a budget of $17.40 and a 16-year-old Buick sedan, has grown to full fire and EMS facility. Wouldn't those 17 men be astonished to see how different things are? The unknown number of lives you have saved, the dangerous fires quenched, sharing your time and expertise with other states and the accommodations you have received. The success of the department for 75 years is credited to those charter members and every member both past and present. We also need to thank the auxiliary members past and present who have supported the mission of the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department, as well as family members who have sacrificed their time so that the members can be at the department. It is with great honor that I call forward Gary Umberzak to be recognized for 50 years of service to the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department. My wife, Barbara, she introduced me to the fire service and I think she's regretted it ever since. I love you for that. It's good to be back home and I know, I know those words are thrown around loosely, but um, I really mean it. It's really good to be back home. So thank you and know that amongst all the fun and fellowship, you guys do some really important life-saving work. When you need help, whether it's a fire or a medical emergency, when you're sick, hurt, or afraid, when you're having the worst day of your life, we will be there to help. We are your first responders. 
We are the West Friendship Volunteer Fire Department.